Welcome to Chartwell Booksellers, Booksellers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm delighted you're here for yet another evening with another uh, extraordinarily interesting book uh, with Winston Churchill in the subtitle. He's not up front this time, but he plays a major role. Uh, the book is Appeasement uh, by uh, Tim Bouvery, and the subtitle is uh, Chamberlain, Hitler, Churchill, and the Road to War, um, which says it all. Appeasement is a subject that I think is, uh, is timely now as well uh, as historically. Um, I'm very interested to know uh, exactly how Mr. Bouvery would frame that for us. Uh, the book reframes uh, information that uh, many of us are familiar with in a marvelously readable um, and uh, exciting new way. Uh, I recommend that you read it strongly, however much you may think you know about appeasement. We never know it all. Um, Mr. Bouvery is a uh, political journalist in the UK and has been for a few years now. Um, and this book is now a bestseller, I'm told, in the UK. And we're dead set on making it uh, the same here in the United States. Uh, the word appeasement, Winston Churchill said, is not popular. But appeasement has its place in all, pos in all policy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Bouvery. Thank you very much. And thank you all very much for coming. This is an amazing uh, bookshop. And I thrilled to be here and even more thrilled to be speaking here. Surrounded by all these books on Winston Churchill, I feel I need to slightly justify why another one needs to be added to the shelves. But it, it's, as the subtitle implies, it is not just a book about Churchill. It's a book about the entire politics of appeasement from the advent of Hitler in January 1933, right through to the moment at which Churchill defeats Halifax over the question of whether or not Britain should enter into negotiations with Germany after the fall of France in May-June 1940. And that was, I think, one of the main reasons for wanting to write the book. So many of the main histories of appeasement focus purely on the year 1938, the climactic year when the Czech crisis occurred and the Munich Agreement solved that crisis. And although that is one of the, the, the centre part of my book, I wanted to go back further to see how British and indeed international reactions varied to the threat of fascism in both Germany and Italy during the 1930s and to see how that changed over the time. I, I thought I'd just give you a, a tiny story about the real moment that I decided to write this book because it might uh, give you an idea of the sort of book it is um, and the sort of issues it's trying to explore. I was reading, as I'm sure many of you have, the diaries of Harold Nicholson as well as other leading uh, politicians and journalists of the time, all of which are published and are wonderful works of literature in their own right. And there was one particular entry in Nicholson's diary from the 10th of May, 1938. And Nicholson, who is a national Labour MP supporting the government, is walking down Piccadilly and he goes into a gentleman's club. And this is on the 10th of May 1938, two months after Hitler had invaded Austria and annexed that country. And Nicholson enters this club and in this club he finds three young peers, three young lords, who admit that they would rather see Hitler in London than have a socialist government. And I was so shocked by this, I wanted to try and find out more about how widespread support for this policy of appeasement, this policy of making concessions to what or specifically reasonable concessions. Nobody wanted to give away parts of Great Britain or indeed any major part of the British Empire to the Nazis, but making reasonable concessions to the dictator states in order to avoid war, how much that had support from the ruling elite and what, if any, effect that had on foreign policy. And in that, I felt incredibly lucky that for this book I was able to get uh, access for the first time to some of the largest uh, aristocratic archives in Britain, these people who uh, 
although highly born and influential in certain ways, had no official link to the British government, but nevertheless went out year on, year out to Nazi Germany and managed to have audiences with Hitler and his leading lieutenants. And these included uh, the papers of the Duke of Buccleuch, who both then and now is Europe's largest landowner, who visited Germany every year between 1933 and 1939, but also the Duke of Westminster, uh, the largest landowner within London, and, and a number of other aristocrats. But I'm not going to talk about them this evening because I thought this is a, a bookshop dedicated to Winston Churchill. I thought I should talk a bit about uh, a different talk to what I normally talk about and talk about Churchill and his great antagonist within British politics during this time, Neville Chamberlain, and to try and um, examine these two characters and discuss the idea of what turned one of them into an appeaser or made one of them an appeaser and the other one the embodiment of resistance and opposition to that policy. They could not have had more different backgrounds, I don't think, Winston Churchill and Neville Chamberlain. Churchill is an aristocrat, the grandson of a duke, the son of a chancellor of the exchequer. Well, Neville Chamberlain is born into the industrialised middle class of Birmingham. His father had made his fortune as a screw manufacturer. And although Joseph Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain's father, was an incredibly distinguished politician who was a colonial secretary and then had, had the unique feat of splitting not only the Liberal Party, but also the Conservative Party uh, himself. Neville Chamberlain was never meant to be his father's political heir. That, was, that mantle was passed to Austin Chamberlain, Neville's elder half-brother who was sent to Trinity College, Cambridge, and then on a grand tour of Europe. Neville, on the other hand, was made to go and farm sisal, which is a hemp-like so it's a plant which is uh, meant to produce a hemp-like substance in the Bahamas between the age of 22 and 26. And this, at this island he was on in the Bahamas was a complete backwater of the British Empire. It really was not a very social place. There were hardly any Western settlers there at all. And under the accepted laws of uh, racial segregation at the time, this meant that Neville Chamberlain had hardly anybody to speak to between the age of 22 and 26. And I think there's a lot to be said for what Alec Douglas Hume, uh, the later British Prime Minister, who was at this, during the 1930s, Neville Chamberlain's principal parliamentary aide, there's a lot to be said for his view, which is that this critical moment in Chamberlain's early development, where he had nobody to speak to, and this business failure, this business scheme was a complete failure, lost his father a vast amount of money, really haunted him and was responsible for this shy, rather aloof, cold character that people then came to know in politics in the subsequent decades. Huge difference with Churchill, who is having an absolute ball, whether it be in the uh, uh, hazards in India or playing polo out there, a hero in the Boer War who's escaped from a prisoner of war camp, a best-selling author, journalist, MP by an extraordinary exceptionally young age, 26, in the cabinet by 34. Neville Chamberlain doesn't enter the House of Commons until he's in his 50s. He's one of the oldest British prime ministers. So they've had very different upbringings. The only thing I think that they have in common, uh, it's just uh, uh, an interesting point, is they're both autodidacts. Neither uh, Winston Churchill nor Neville Chamberlain went to university. Uh, and they both felt this quite keenly. Or, and sought to make up for it by an enormous amount of reading. Winston Churchill in both South Africa and in India asking his mother to send out all the works of Gibbon and Macaulay and it's through reading these great British historians that that unparalleled eloquence sprang. And Neville Chamberlain similarly reading those sorts of books but also particularly Shakespeare. So they're, they're both, they've both taught themselves most of what they know, because they did not receive the sort of liberal humani humanities education which most British statesmen did. But there I think the uh, comparisons cease. It, in, w with regard to their character, they are almost entirely opposite. Churchill, garrulous, emotional, emotional sociable, eccentric, humorous, moody, volatile. Chamberlain, staid, serious, austere, precise, and yet entirely sure of himself at all times. One of the greatest myths 
which I think people have about Neville Chamberlain, is somehow that this was a weak character who gave in to Adolf Hitler. He was actually one of the strongest prime ministers that Great Britain has ever had, with a massive parliamentary majority, which and used he used all of the apparatuses of his office to great effect to see his policies through, and that's something I'll come on to. Their greatest political difference was, of course, over Adolf Hitler and the threat which he and Nazi Germany posed to European security. Churchill has got so much wrong, we, we, we all have to remember, by the early 30s, that people pay very little attention to what he has to say in warning about Nazi Germany. This is a man who's changed party not once but twice, is the author of the Gallipolis and Dardanelles catastrophe of 1915, puts Britain back on the gold standard at the end of the First World War, advocates sending British expeditionary force to take part in the Russian Civil War during the 1920s. In the middle of the 1930s, plays a, catast uh, plays a really bad hand in the House of Commons over the abdication of Edward VIII. And as one of his leading lieutenants says at the time, oh dear, Winston has undone all the good he's done in the last five years years in 15 minutes. So he's got so much wrong that it, it's perhaps not that surprising that people don't take his very accurate and prescient warnings about Nazi Germany seriously at the beginning. But very prescient they, they were, and it's in fact even before Hitler comes to power in January 1933 that Churchill is warning of the German danger. The argument which the Germans, the Nazis, and Hitler made throughout most of the 1930s, certainly until 1938, was that they were not after a war of revenge or any sort of major territorial expansion, but merely that they were after equality of status with the other European powers. This is a great, proud, militaristic nation which has been humiliated by the Treaty of Versailles, this treaty which ended the First World War. And if only they could be allowed the same status as Britain and France with regard to colonies with regard to armaments and the military, then they would simmer down. Churchill completely ridiculed this. It is in November 1932, four months, uh, before, sorry, uh, three months before Hitler comes to power, that he tells the House of Commons that status is not what Germany is seeking. All these bands of sturdy Teutonic youths marching along the streets and roads of Germany with the light in their eyes of desire to suffer for their fatherland are not looking for status. They're looking for weapons, and when they have weapons, believe me, they will ask for the return, the restoration of lost territories and colonies. I imagine a lot of you are very familiar with the idea of Churchill battling alone, warning of the, this Cassandra-like figure, warning of the German danger in the 1930s. But one of the things which, uh, the major themes which I was fascinated to explore in my research and which I make a great play of in the book, are how many other people were warning the British government right from the very beginning of this extraordinary danger. Britain's first ambassador to Nazi Germany, Sir Horace Rumbold, sent the British government a masterly 5,000 word dispatch in July 1935, five months after Hitler had come to power, warning very accurately of the likely course that Hitler would take in the 1930s. And Rumbold was able to do this because he had read Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography come political treaties in which Hitler had fairly accurately set out his plans to build up a sufficient military might and then start to aggressively revise and eviscerate the clauses of the Treaty of Versailles before going on to, quote Mein Kampf, annihilate Germany's historic enemy France and then begin to develop a new German empire in the East, in particular in Russia. And Rumbold wasn't alone. Uh, there's a, a character I, whose dispatches I enjoyed reading very much called Brigadier A.C. Tempoli, who was a delegate to this really farcical conference that was going on in Geneva between 1932 and the end of 1933, a general disarmament conference in which all the powers were meant to be discussing how they were going to get rid of weapons while Germany was secretly building up large stockpiles of weapons. And Templey wrote to the British government to say that it would be absolute madness for the British government to be talking about disarming at this time, a time when Germany was, quote, in a 
quote, delirium of reawakened nationalism and of the most blatant and dangerous militarism. The whole of the German nation, Templey wrote, was being infused with the spirit of war and alleged programmes for the inculcation of discipline such as defence, sport, were merely camouflage for intensive military training. There is a mad dog abroad once more, Templey concluded his paper, and we must resolutely combine to ensure its destruction or at least its confinement until the disease has run its course. So why didn't the British government listen? Why didn't they listen to Churchill? There are some personal reasons which I've alluded to why they didn't listen to Churchill, but why didn't they listen to Templey? Why didn't they listen to Sir Horace Rumbold and many others? Very obvious reason to begin with is the enormous tragedy that was the First World War, the million British and Commonwealth war dead that resulted from that catastrophe led to a very strong desire that no such war should ever occur again. That's universal. It includes Churchill. The great danger and the real political, moral, well, political dilemma, but, but it, it, it touched on morality in some ways, which contemporaries struggled with throughout this period and which is at the centre of my book, is at what stage does your very legitimate desire to avoid war make that war actually more likely? That you are, by your very actions in trying to avoid war, somehow encouraging these aggressors to further acts of aggression and also making them stronger? At what stage does war become inevitable and it's not actually about trying to avoid war but about picking your battlefield, about deciding that this is the moment that you are at your maximum strength, not just in terms of arms but diplomatically and strategically to confront that? The British politicians felt that they were hamstrung by public opinion. In February 1933, the Oxford Union, this bastion of tradition and uh, British elitism, this uh, fulcrum for uh, this uh, forgery, rather, for British statesmen for centuries before, passed the motion that this house would under no circumstance fight for its king and its country. And this is followed by a famous by-election in London in which a conservative majority, a very large conservative majority, is overturned by a Labour candidate standing on a platform of unilateral disarmament. Just a note on the Labour Party at this time. The Labour Party was able to write, subsequent to the Second World War, an amazing history saying that they alone had stood up to, wanted to stand up to fascism in the 1930s. And indeed, that's something that they campaigned on very successfully in the 1945 general election. The Labour Party, although implacably opposed to fascism, voted against every single measure of rearmament that was brought before the British House of Commons between 1933 and 1939, including the reintroduction of conscription in July 1939 after Hitler had broken up the uh, Munich Agreement. So while the Conservatives have uh, the stain of appeasement uh, from the 1930s, if the Labour Party had had their way, then Britain would have had absolutely no weapons with which to resist fascist aggression during the 1940s. The arch-villain, for those of you who've read, which I imagine quite a few of you, Winston Churchill's first volume of his war memoirs, The Gathering Storm, is not actually Neville Chamberlain. It is Chamberlain's predecessor, Stanley Baldwin. And it is mainly Baldwin's failure to rearm that uh, Churchill go go has a go over at him for. There's a, a great line uh, Churchill says later, I don't mean to be, I wish Stanley no ill, but it would be far better for the world if he had never been born. Um, <laughs> Stanley Baldwin makes this extraordinary confession to the House of Commons in March 1936 when he's being attacked for the fact that Britain has not sufficiently rearmed and now it's very obvious that Germany's got a mighty military and people are asking him in the House of Commons why he do hasn't done this. He says that he could think of no policy which would have meant the loss of the 1935 general election more certain. He said it would have been absolutely impossible to convince the people to vote for a party which told the truth about the danger of Germany and the need to rearm. And Churchill famously uh, references this in his book, The Gathering Storm, in the index under Baldwin confesses putting party before country. Rather ironically, Neville Chamberlain actually is an ally, a se rather secret ally of Winston Churchill's in the early 1930s about Churchill's main 
demand, which is that Britain build up a massive air force with which to deter Nazi Germany. Neville Chamberlain is the Chancellor of the Exchequer at this time, and he is the driving force of the government. Stanley Baldwin is a distinctly lazy prime minister, and the actual prime minister for the early part of the 30s, Baldwin was sort of de facto prime minister, Ramsay MacDonald, was um, increasingly senile. So Neville Chamberlain is the driving force of this government. And he takes away large chunks of money which were going to be spent on the army and the navy and gives it to the air force. He does this because it is a cheaper option and almost all chancellor of the exchequers always prefer a cheaper option. But he also does this because he's got this idea which is far from unique to him that the next war is not going to see a clash of armies. It is all going to be about who can threaten the other nation with the destruction of the civilian population fastest. Baldwin refers to it in the House of Commons. It comes down to basically, can we assure the Germans that we can kill more of their women and children than they can kill of ours and therefore deter them? It's a very early concept, I think, of the theory of mutually assured destruction, that if we have these vast air forces with these bombers, that somehow this would keep the peace. So uh, there is there is this um, uh, strange uh, continuity between Churchill's and Chamberlain's thoughts at this time. They do, however, and, and it also should be said, by the way, that Churchill is prepared to pull punches during the 30s when he thinks it's politically expedient. Most historians, and I would agree with them, would say that the last chance of stopping Hitler without an all-out war was the remilitarization of the Rhineland in March 1936. The Rhineland, this highly industrialized area of northwest Germany on the French-Belgian border. And the Germans marched in. It was a massive gamble. There were only 20,000 German troops marched into the Rhineland facing a million strong French army. And this, this Hitler admitted was a gamble, all the German top brass admitted it was a huge gamble. The French could have pushed them out incredibly easily. Churchill says hardly anything about this. He doesn't make a great statement that Britain should become uh, involved and should be supporting France and expelling the Germans. And he does this for a very simple reason, which is that the government has finally decided that there should be one minister to coordinate all three of the main defence departments, the uh, War Office, which is in charge of the Army, the Admiralty, and the Air Ministry. And it, he is widely tipped for this post. So he doesn't say very much. And uh, he really should have done, because Stanley Baldwin had absolutely no intention of giving him this job, and in fact gave it to a, a man called Sir Thomas Inskip, who, as people quite rightly said at the time, was uh, the most cynical appointment since Caligula had made his horse a consul. Neville Chamberlain has a very different idea of appeasement to his successors. I, I, I try and chart in the book where this idea, idea of appeasement uh, comes from. I think the first written reference I found to it in the context of appeasing Germany post the First World War came from a liberal minister, a British liberal minister of education called Hal Fisher, who was also a historian, who, effective, who had been at the disarmament, had been at the peace conference in 1919. And he effectively said in a letter, look, this treaty that we've forced the Germans to sign is far from perfect, but hopefully over the years we can make adjustments to it and therefore appease the Germans. Anthony Eden, who was later to have a massive reputation as a serious anti-appeaser, used the word appeasement constantly in the House of Commons, both as Deputy Foreign Secretary and as Foreign Secretary in the early 1930s. It was not in any way a pejorative word until much later on in the decade. But whereas, while Neville Chamberlain did not invent the policy of appeasement, he became the sort of leader of what I termed evangelical appeasement. It was to become, once he became Prime Minister in May 1937, a far more active policy than it had been hitherto. He very frankly, he had a very businesslike uh, way of doing things. He had an enormous high energy as a prime minister, and he was determined that if only the British could go and visit the Germans, and as he said to the Soviet ambassador, go through with Herr Hitler, with pencil in hand, all of his demands and cross off what is unacceptable and tick what is acceptable, then he was sure that some sort of accommodation between 
Nazi Germany and Great Britain could occur, which would allow for Germany to be a great power in the centre of Europe and for the British Empire to survive. This is the beginning of a, a sign of a big difference of opinion between Chamberlain and Churchill. Chamberlain's policy is entirely logical and sound and reasonable, provided that you believe that Adolf Hitler is entirely logical, sound and reasonable. And Churchill and uh, a number of other people by certainly May 1937, when by this time Hitler has remilitarized the Rhineland, has broken all of the armaments clauses of the Treaty of Versailles, is posing a very serious, serious threat. But Chamberlain's very determined to do this. He also places great store on personal diplomacy and charm and just simply convincing the Germans that we wanted to be friends with them. And one of his first acts in foreign policy is to send his most trusted minister, Lord Halifax, out to visit Hitler at Berchtesgaden, Hitler's um, retreat near Salzburg, in order to do precisely this, to try and find out exactly what it is that Hitler wants, but also to make Hitler an offer for a new German colony in Central Africa. There's this idea that uh, Germany has to expand somewhere, and if Germany expands in Europe, there's going to be a war, but we could quite happily allow her to expand in Central Africa. Not, it should be said, at the expense of British possessions in Central Africa, but at the, at the expense of... Um, possessions belonging at the time to Portugal and Holland. Um, I don't think either the Portuguese or the Dutch were consulted about this offer before it was made, but nevertheless it was made by Halifax. Halifax was given incredibly explicit instructions by his direct superior, the Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden. Whatever you do, you must emphasise to Hitler, Eden said, that we in Britain would take an extremely dim view of it if you interfere in the internal affairs of either Austria or Czechoslovakia, and that power politics in this region has the possibility of starting a European war, which we cannot guarantee that we will not be a part of. That, that, that's a, the warning that Eden wants him to develop. Halifax, who has worked out an entirely separate idea with Neville Chamberlain and the then British ambassador to Germany, Sir Neville Henderson, does completely the opposite. He tells Hitler at Berchtesgaden in November 1937 that the British have no problem with the Germans possibly uh, uniting with Austria, or indeed the Sudeten Germans of Czechoslovakia uniting with the Reich, provided it is done peacefully. This is the opposite of the warning that he was meant to give, and uh, Hitler takes it for the effective green lights that it was, and it's not long before the Germans are in Austria and then making demands on Czechoslovakia. Again, the, the difference of opinion, if we look at Ch Churchill and Chamberlain, what is reasonable and what is not. Halifax and Chamberlain's argument is that this area of Central Europe has never been a strategic concern of Britain's. Austria, people thought, is German anyway. They speak German, even though it's never been part of Germany. These, there are all these three and a quarter million ethnic Germans in Czechoslovakia, even though they've never been part of modern Germany. They were also subject, subjects of the Habsburgs. But this is not a British concern. We are a maritime and trading power, imperial power. Central and Eastern Europe have never been British concerns. We could, if Hitler, it is in fact certainly not worth a war which would result almost certainly in the loss of the British Empire and in which we could be defeated to deny these fairly legitimate demands of Adolf Hitler. Churchill's view, which I think is interesting and says a lot about the fact that during the 1930s, his main literary project is his life of Marlborough, his great ancestor, and uh, fighting it, who's fighting against uh, Louis XIV at the time. Churchill reminds Chamberlain and reminds the House of Commons on numerous occasions that one of the oldest tenets of British foreign policy is that it has been British policy to deny any one power domination of the continent. And that is why England fought against Louis XIV in the 17th century. It's why we opposed the ambitions of Napoleon in the late 18th and 19th centuries. It's why we opposed the Kaiserreich in the early 20th century. And it is why we eventually opposed the Third Reich. And it's it is a combination of that judgment, at what point does one power dominating the continent threaten British and Western democracies, that 
the, the fault line goes between appeasement and anti-appeasement, and then a more subjective judgment. Can you trust Hitler? Hitler is continually declaring his pacifism, his huge respect for Great Britain and her empire. He doesn't care about France. He's always trying to detach Britain from France and saying that we could have a great, we could effectively carve up the world together. If you took Hitler at his word and he said that the Sudetenland, where, which was the cause of Britain almost going to war with Germany in late 1938, if the Sudetenland was Hitler's last territorial demand, then conceding it to him made perfect sense. It was certainly not worth a world war and the destruction of British cities, cities to deny three and a quarter million Germans joining the Reich if they really wanted to. But by 1938, there are an awful lot of people who are saying that this is not Hitler's last demand. And as the French Prime Minister Edward Deladier tells Neville Chamberlain to his face, what we are dealing with is a far more sinister version of Napoleon. This is Napoleon a, with a racial tint to his ideology, which makes him uh, even, even more sinister. Neville Chamberlain is confronted with other evidence as well. There's a book which was hugely influential in its day by an Australian historian called Stephen Roberts called The House That Hitler Built, and it came out in December 1937. And it's an amazing analysis of Nazism and all the treaties that Hitler had broken. This, this Australian historian had travelled around Nazi Germany over the previous year, spoken to lots of people, he had read Mein Kampf, and Roberts was absolutely adamant that Hitler could not achieve his aims without a major European war. Hitler was bent on war. And Chamberlain read this book, and he wrote to his half-sisters in January 1938, if I accepted Roberts' conclusions, I would despair but I don't and won't. He was an incredibly stubborn prime minister who was always uh, looking for the bright side and always prepared to take Hitler at his word. And that is what you see when uh, Chamberlain flies out on his first mission to see Hitler on the 15th of September 1938 to keep the peace over the Sudetenland. This causes an enormous amount of euphoria throughout Britain and throughout, throughout the world. It's an amazing gesture a nearly septuagenarian prime minister flying to save the world from war when shuttle diplomacy was very, very rare in those days. Everyone's going mad about it. Everyone except Churchill, who says, um, I think it's the stupidest thing that's ever been done. Uh, there's another story I love about Churchill at this time. It, 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 a great element of his uh, wit. Chamberlain visits Hitler not once, but twice, but three times. And on his second visit to Hitler when the meeting at Bad Godesburg on the 22nd of September 1938 is going extremely badly and people back in London are starting to get a whiff of this, that there may be war over the Sudetenland and Churchill's got this big meeting of the anti-appeasement anti MPs in his flat at Morpeth Mansions and everyone's discussing what's going to happen and Churchill says, well, if Hitler makes more demands, then we shall have war. It's quite as simple as that. And someone then says well, won't it be a bit awkward if um, we then got our prime minister on German territory at the time that this is going to happen? And Churchill, I don't know for certain that he smiled, but I can't imagine that he didn't smile when he then said, even the Germans would not be so stupid as to deprive us of our beloved prime minister. <laughs> the... I, I did, there's just one quotation, just uh, which I thought I, I just read to you, which really emphasises, firstly, how central Chamberlain saw Churchill as his main opponent, the main man, a uh, domestic opponent, that is, the man who was offering an alternative thesis and an alternative course for the government, and also why he discounted this. This is what he wrote about uh, Churchill's warnings about Nazi Germany. Actually, he wrote about this. This is from 1936, when he was still Chancellor of the Exchequer. If the menace of attack from Germany is as in imminent as Winston would have us believe, there is nothing we could do which would make us ready to meet it. But I do not believe that it is imminent. By careful diplomacy, I believe we can stave it off, perhaps indefinitely. But if we were now to follow Winston's advice and sacrifice our commerce to the manufacture of arms, we should inflict a certain injury upon our trade from which it would take generations to recover. The Munich Agreement, I thought I'd just um, 
end by t talking about the Munich Agreement and how Chamberlain and Churchill perceived it and also some of the myths about this agreement. Chamberlain, in signing the Munich Agreement and preventing a European war over the Sudetenland is hailed as a hero. He comes back, waves his piece of paper, saying as uh, the sign that both he and the German Führer regard the Munich Agreement as a symbol of the sincere desire of their two countries never go, never to go to war with one another again. And then having driven through teeming crowds all the way to Buckingham Palace, he is welcomed by the King and Queen onto the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Neville Chamberlain was the first commoner in history to go on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. And this was, this was a flagrantly uh, unconstitutional act because it showed support for the impartial, uh, the, the monarchy was giving support to his policy. And uh, there, there's quite a lot in my book about the general support that the royal family gave to the policy of appeasement. And then having been on the balcony, he goes back to Downing Street and opens the first floor window and says to the teeming crowd, what is probably the most famous false boast in history, which is that he has brought back not only peace with honour, but peace for our time. Churchill, on the other hand, makes one of his greatest speeches in the House of Commons three days later, when he says that we have, dis we have sustained a defeat without war, but this is not the end. This is only the beginning of the reckoning. This is only the first sip, the first foretaste of a bitter cup which will be proffered to us year by year, unless by a supreme recovery of moral health and martial vigour we arise again and take our stand for freedom as in the olden time. The traditional defence of the Munich Agreement by historians and Chamberlain supporters is that it bought Britain an extra year with which to rearm and then to confront Nazi Germany. And there is quite a bit to be said for this. The Spitfires, Hurricanes and Radar, all of which made the difference between victory and defeat in the Battle of Britain, were not ready in September 1938, but were ready by September 1939. What this argument ignores is that, firstly, the, it is not a zero-sum year, it's not a zero-sum game. There is, there is this extra year, but the extra year is enjoyed by the Germans as well. And if you look at the figures, it's fairly clear that the Germans out-armed the British in the air and on land. Secondly, the Germans were in absolutely no position to wage a long-range strategic bombing campaign against even France, let alone Great Britain, in September 1938, the majority of the Luftwaffe was arrayed against the Czechs on the, their eastern border. And finally, this was an argument only made in retrospect. Although Neville Chamberlain was aware and acutely aware of deficiencies in British arms at the time, it was not so much that he thought he was delaying war, but avoiding it altogether, as both he said at the time and his principal advisers attested to. And the real proof of this is after the Munich Agreement, when Chamberlain has returned and all this euphoria is going on, leading members of the cabinet, including Lord Halifax, who has actually turned during the Czech crisis from leading a PISA to a leading resistor, at least within the cabinet, they come to Chamberlain and say, well, you've been very lucky this time. We can never be put in this position again. Hitler is not done. There, there are going to be further challenges. We must massively, massively increase rearmament in order to defend ourselves. And Chamberlain refuses. He says, but I brought back peace. It was not about delaying war for a year. It was about avoiding it altogether. And it is only after the Munich Agreement was completely torn up that Chamberlain even countenanced increasing uh, British rearmament. The other great problem which Churchill was so right, in my view, in pointing out, was that by sacrificing the Czechs in September 1938, we not only lowered our prestige massively in the world, and this is a, a rather strange idea to discuss now, particularly at a time when, uh, sadly, uh, Britain doesn't have very much prestige at the moment, but at that time when we were the masters of an empire covering a quarter of the globe, and yet the tiniest, tiniest 
military presence were, were within these countries. Prestige, moral authority, however hypocritical you may believe it to be, counted for a huge amount. And it is on that notion of prestige and moral authority that persuaded Halifax to become a resistor. He is told by his permanent undersecretary at the Foreign Office, how do you think we can keep India? How can we keep Egypt and all the rest if we are seen to give in to the bullying of Hitler, who is demanding not necessarily just the Sudetenland, but the whole of Czechoslovakia at gunpoint. Churchill sees it as, a, as an extraordinary defeat for British prestige, but it is also a diplomatic and strategic defeat because Czechoslovakia was not only the ally of France, but the ally of the Soviet Union. And there was hardly, there was not, in fact, a politician in Britain who had said ruder things or hated communism and the Soviet Union more than Winston Churchill. And yet Churchill was prepared and wise enough to realize that the, the more immediate danger, the actual danger to Western life and British life and European security came not from communist Russia, but from Nazi Germany. And he realized that therefore, in, and in order to defeat Nazi Germany, which was an incredibly tough nut to crack and almost wasn't cracked, Germany would have to be confronted with a two front war from the very beginning. And that meant an alliance with the Soviets. And by failing to stand by the Czechs in September 1938, we lost the chance of developing that alliance with the Soviet Union. We convinced Stalin also that the British and the French would never stand up to Hitler, that they would continue appeasing him and ultimately trying to stoke a war between the Soviets and the Nazis. And this is not mere Stalin's paranoia, although he was exceptionally paranoid. Uh, Stanley Baldwin is not the only British politician who keeps on saying in the 1930s, well, I don't mind war, but if there's going to be war, I do hope it's going to be between, be between the Nazis and the communists and these two ghastly regimes can kill each other. And very finally, it, it didn't work. Churchill was right. Hitler could, not, uh, Hitler could not be trusted. This was not his last territorial demand. And within a few months, he had torn up the Munich Agreement and entered Prague. Had, he, had Chamberlain be right in accepting him at his word, and he continually told the cabinet that he trusted this man, he trusted his word, had Chamberlain be right, there would be statues of him and not necessarily statues, and there probably wouldn't be any statues of Winston Churchill because he wouldn't have needed to come to power because Chamberlain would have assured peace. But he was wrong, and it, it is this critical misjudgment of Hitler as a character and of the Nazi regime and its aims and its ideology, which is his undoing. The great irony is that Chamberlain's own delusional, rather vain belief that he himself could persuade Hitler to stay his hand or limit his demands by his own personal intervention, which he continually talks about, the so-called Chamberlain touch, is then actually repeated by Churchill when he believes in his negotiations with Joseph Stalin during the Second World War that he can persuade Stalin from annexing most of Eastern Europe. And I think, and there are so many other examples I've thought of s s subsequently and can certainly be applied to both current British and uh, US politics, I think, of leaders who believe that their own personal chutzpah and diplomacy can overcome very well-stated and well-known national interests and I international wars, laws. So I think that the best that can be said of uh, appeasement is, is that old adage that the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Thank you very much. Yes, superbly explicated. And uh, I do see we have some questions. And we have microphones for your questions. So uh, I think this gentleman has one. But we need it so we can get you as part of this broadcast, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be, as a fellow Englishman, I'd be curious how Churchill's, you know, whole thing is going to feed into Boris's negotiations with Europe. And I'm going off topic, I know, but um, in terms of, in, as far as Boris has endorsed, like embraced Churchill as his hero. How's that going to play out in terms of negotiations with Europe? I, I think most of the European uh, leaders uh, have a fairly 
accurate view of uh, both the British Prime Minister and Winston Churchill, and they could not be more different. Uh, aside from uh, Churchill's well-known uh, sympathy and encouragement of some form of uh, Europe, he uses the word that we need to have a, a European federation and one large country after the Second World War to stop this ever happening again. The one thing I actually, I tried so many ways to work out what you could say linked all the anti-appeasers and what linked all the appeasers. And Andrew Roberts made a very interesting observation in Eminent Churchillians that the leading anti-appeasers all had uh, fine war records in the First World War, Churchill, Harold Macmillan, Anthony Eden, etc., etc. Whereas Neville Chamberlain, Sam Hoare, Sir John Simon and Lord Halifax never saw frontline action or didn't fight at all. That, I'm, I sadly didn't hold water, and I am coming, I will answer your question, that, di that didn't hold water because uh, actually the vast majority of the 1930s House of Commons had seen military service in the First World War, and yet passionately supported appeasement. But the one thing I did think that almost all of the anti-peacers had in common was their strong sense of British history as part of the continent of Europe. All of these people were massive Francophiles. They adored France. They were, uh, most of them spoke French, even if it was very bad French like Churchill's. And they, they had, whereas, whereas the anti-peacers tended to view foreign policy from the perspective of the empire and the far-flung dominions. So I don't think any of the, I don't even think that uh, Boris Johnson's uh, sycophantic uh, cheerleaders in the British press think that he's uh, is really very like Winston Churchill. Um, but I certainly wouldn't imagine the Europeans do. I'm curious whether or not you have come to a view as to how the Spanish Civil War played a part, because it, it did occur during the period of the appeasement, mm. 1936 to about 1939. And I know that both um, uh, Germany and, and France and Britain supported different sides in that, uh, a proxy war, if you will. Uh, how, how do you feel that that war played, and Britain's role in it, however limited, um, played into the views of um, uh, Mr. Churchill, Mr. Chamberlain, etc.? Well, I think the Spanish Civil War is very important for, because it's another example of the West failing to take a stand. The Germans and the Italians become very actively involved and bomb the hell out of the Republicans. But despite the fact that France has got a socialist government, uh, uh, Blum, the French prime minister, is so convinced or is, is convinced by his uh, uh, associates that to directly aid the Republicans, as France would naturally wish to do, the French government would wish to do, would lead to civil war in France, that he's not prepared to do it. Britain is torn. Uh, there, there, Churchill says a, norm, an, a large number of things which are fairly supportive of Franco, and he wasn't a great uh, Republican. It's the, it's the main cause of the Labour Party. It takes attention away from the dangers of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany because the Labour Party focus entirely on Spain. But I think from the perspective of appeasement, the main point of the Spanish Civil War is it's, it's a further signal. It's one of the many uh, moments at which the Western powers do nothing and allow the uh, dictators to get away with, quite literally, with murder, and helps convince the dictators that the Western powers are decadent, that they're weak, and that they will always bend when confronted with strength. Yes. If the British chiefs of staff never advocated uh, ending appeasement or doing something to derail Hitler's moves prior to Poland, uh, would abandoning appeasement have meant ignoring the advice of the professional military and adopting the view of Churchill and his informal advisors and so forth? I did, very good question. You, The British military were really pretty defeatist throughout this entire time. I, I think one of the interesting things both in France and Britain during the 30s is that the military establishment in both countries consistently overestimates German strength. They're completely gulled by German propaganda of these amazing films, all these endless columns of tanks and aeroplanes, and underestimate their own. They don't give a general view as to whether or not we, the British and the French, could win a war. I mean, I think they generally think that we would survive, that nobody is saying that we, we were going to be defeated, that eventually our superior resources and our empire would, and the small stretch of water between us and the continent would see us safely through. Uh, 
But they do give consistent advice that there is absolutely nothing that Britain could do or France could do to stop the Germans from taking over Czechoslovakia or Austria or indeed Poland, as indeed proved the case. So it would have required uh, a certain amount of the politicians overruling the advice of the military, but not entirely. They, the military weren't giving a general view as to whether or not is it war now or war later, and if it's war now or war later, is it actually better to go now rather than later? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim Bouverie. It's a very knotty business, and that really was superbly laid out in, uh, in, in really in all its nuances. Uh, it's a book worth reading, and uh, we will be selling it to you now, and Tim will be signing all the copies. So uh, thank you for coming, and please join us at the table with the books. Sure.